Hello, everyone. It's showtime. It's the Michael Shermer Show, and I'm your host, Michael Shermer. My guest today is Stuart Weiss with his new book, The Uses of Delusion, Why It's Not Always Rational to Be Rational. Or you might say there's rational irrationalities. Stuart Weiss is a behavioral scientist, teacher, and writer. He taught at Providence College, the University of Rhode Island, and Connecticut College. Weiss's book, Believing in Magic, the Psychology of Superstition, won the 1999 William James Book Award of the American Psychological Association. He's a contributing editor of Skeptical Inquirer magazine, where he writes the Behavior and Belief column. And he's a fellow of the Association for Psychological Science and of the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. So Stuart and I, well, we've known each other a long time, and I was a big fan of his book, Believing in Magic, and I've used it often in my own writings and research. Here we discuss what is a delusion, veridical perception, did we evolve to perceive reality accurately, perceptual illusions and irrationalities, that is, if I'm fooled by one of these kind of intro-psych visual illusions, does that make me irrational? We discuss the debate between two sides, the kind of uh, the Kahneman side, that humans are basically irrational, and the Gerd Gingerinzer side, that we are bounded rationality, that is, we're rational beings when in the right circumstances. We talk about rational choice theory and homo economicus. Do we maximize utility, or I should say, when do we maximize utility? Uh, William Clifford versus William James, which is a debate in Stewart's book about when it's okay to believe something upon insufficient evidence, that is, let's call it faith. When is it okay to do that? Death and delusion. Is it useful to believe death is not the end of consciousness and self that serves some kind of role uh, such that it may be even evolved uh, to do that? We talk about paradoxical behavior and the underlying reasons for apparent paradoxes. Self-delusions, that is delusions about the self, but also when do we deceive and self-deceive? Optimism and over-optimism, depressive realism, bluffing the self and others. The difference between lies and bullshit, self-control, willpower, and time discounting, and then the larger picture of willpower, free will, self-determinism, determinism, and all those uh, big issues. All right. It's a great conversation. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks for listening. And if you do, please do support uh, the Skeptic Society and the podcast and our magazine. Here is our Flat Earth Society uh, investigation of skeptic you can find skeptic at uh, any bookstore or newsstand and or go online at skeptic.com slash donate to donate or just go to skeptic.com and click around and see all the different things that we produce all right thanks for listening and here's the episode this episode is brought to you by wondrium a series of college level audio and video courses and documentaries produced and distributed by the teaching company you've all heard me talk about them before I have two courses myself with the teaching company, Skepticism 101 and Conspiracism 101. Conspiracies and Conspiracy Theories, it's actually called. Anyway, Wondrium brings you engaging educational content through short-form videos, long-form courses, tutorials, how-to lessons, travelogues, documentaries, and more, covering every topic you've ever wondered about and many you probably thought you never have wondered about. Here's one I just found that just popped up on my app today. Why are we fat? Oh, boy. Well, <laughs> this is a problem uh, I've dealt with for the last 25 years. I'm not fat, but I have like, you know, 15 pound, all right, 20 pounds above my cycling weight when I was a professional cyclist, so I would like to lose that. How can I do that? Right, this is a three-part series each Episode is 45 minutes long. The first one is intro into the bod pod. And then the most hated activity, exercise and sleep in the gut. Okay, why are we fat? Obesity is the biggest health crisis on the planet. For the first time in history, children are facing shorter lives than their parents. Presented by diabetic and once overweight chef Simon Galt. This series explores the science behind a recent re-examination of traditionally accepted health advice and the emergence of new evidence that at last makes sense of the looming health problems we face. Okay, I haven't heard this yet. I'm going to listen to it this week. Um, because we do know some stuff like don't eat too much sugar 
and carbs that apparently converts quickly to fat. Uh, for me, exercise, no problem. I can exercise till the cows come home. It's the what I eat afterwards because I'm hungry after I exercise. So I'll be curious to see what they have to say about that. Anyway, check it out. Here's the deal. If you subscribe to Wondrium at the greatly discounted uh, annual subscription rate through this podcast, um, you get a free trial and that discount. So check it out. Go to wondrium.com slash Shermer. That's Wondrium, W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M, uh, dot com slash Shermer, and you'll get the uh, free trial and the greatly discounted annual subscription rate. It's great. There's just hundreds and hundreds of amazing college courses on there. I've listened to dozens and dozens myself as well with it. Check it out. Here's our episode. Nice to see you. Good to have you on. Your new book is The Uses of Delusion, Why It's Not Always Rational to Be Rational, or you might say rational irrationalities or some such thing. All right. Give us the lowdown. What is a delusion? Well, a delusion is something that you believe that isn't rational, that is that is not based in evidence. Uh, and, uh, and you know, I, it's it, many people who talk about irrationality, you know, this is an example of something that's irrational, uh, talk about uh, epistemic irrationality, which is, you know, a belief that is not based in reality, is not a sound belief, not, not logical. Uh, and then instrumental rationality, which is doing something that uh, is not consistent with with your beliefs. So, so the action itself, and uh, and so th- you know that's sort of the groundwork that I that I work with. It's the idea that that um, that you're behaving in a way that is irrational, and yet in these instances it it it's, appears to be beneficial. And you know, Michael, I spent my whole career as you have. Uh, you know, trying to get people to be more rational. And, and you know, I worked on superstition for a long time. And uh, I, I kept bumping up against the fact that, you know, that sometimes these things benefit people. And, and uh, to be purely objective about it, I, I had to acknowledge that. And so, so this book is really coming from a place of humility in a way, uh, and recognizing that there are some aspects of irrational behavior that that do benefit us. Yeah, I should probably give a, a broader sweep of your work. You're, you're a, a longtime psychologist and columnist for Skeptical Inquirer, writing about superstitions and pseudoscience and magical thinking and so on. And, you know, one of the frustrations we all have in this business is, you know, how do we get people to become more rational? So what you're arguing here is that there's it, we're never going to get there in a way because underlying the apparent irrationalities or delusional thinking is a kind of rational argument or something that's on some other plane uh, that makes sense to the person holding it. It works for them pragmatically. It makes them feel better or it it bonds them to their political tribe or their religious group, um, or it's just a useful fiction to believe you have free will or whatever. And that we're never going to get there because there's no there there to get there. Right. Yeah, I mean, Jonathan Barron has this view that, you know, what's rational is what works, right? That, that if he, he has the quote that I use in the book, that he's, he says that, uh, that, you know, if following every rule of logic got you to the good life, got, you know, worked, worked well for you and, and brought happiness, then that's rational. But he says, if if assiduously breaking every single rule of logic brought you the good life, then that's rational too. And uh, I, it, you know, it's a fairly strong statement. I I doubt that that's going to be true in very many circumstances. But obviously, the book is 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 designed to give some examples of cases where where uh, doing things that don't make sense, that are not really rational or or in conform to reason nonetheless benefit the people who use him. Mm. Yeah, let's let's um, drill down a little bit more on that epistemic versus instrumental um, uh, distinction you make there. Let's say I believe Elvis is still alive, and I have a cult following, I have a web page, I wrote a book, I have a documentary, and I have a, a Patreon fund me, GoFundMe page to support this, and I have you know 100,000 followers, 
and we all agree that Elvis is actually still in um, in Memphis. He's at Graceland. <laughs> he's he's in the house, and uh, and so then I arrange uh, for a a big gathering outside the gates of Graceland. Let's let's just say it's on a January sixth, <laughs> and we meet there, and I give a big speech saying, you know, he's in there. Let's go let's go peacefully down there. And, uh, and and expose the fraud that he's been he's dead he's in there now I just go back to my hotel room and turn on the TV to watch the ensuing chaos but a bunch of my <laughs> followers go in and they break in now so who's responsible for that am I or are the f- people that actually break and enter and to what extent is that you know that there I'm just saying I believe it but I'm not going to do anything about it but the believers followers of me they actually act on it. Well, first of all, that the first question I have is in this very amusing scenario is, uh, do you really believe it or are you fooling those those followers? I mean, that's mm. the first question. Mm. Do you? Yes. Or? Well, so I, get, I guess with my analogy, it would be, yeah, I really believe it. Because I think Trump, well, okay, I think Trump does believe <laughs> the, the election was rigged. I mean, he's quite capable of self-delusion, obviously, I think. Um, yeah. unless it's all just a reality show and, and he knows inside it's not rigged, just like he knows his audience on the, uh, on his, uh, inauguration day was not the largest ever. You know, it's hard to say what's in somebody's heart, but let's just say for, for analogy, I actually believe Elvis is, is still alive and well, he's in the house. In, yeah. In that case, I mean, that's clearly, I would, I would say epistemic, uh, irrationality. You know, you, you are not, uh, you know, the evidence does not support that view. I can't imagine why, you know, what would be involved in keeping that particular secret. Why, you know, either he's either he's held in a hermetically sealed container uh, <laughs> and can't get out, you know, or uh, or there's a huge conspiracy of some kind to keep it quiet. So so I think that, you know, the basic principles of Oakham's razor would suggest that that, you know, the belief is wrong. Uh, and then what you do with it, though, I mean, in that sense, it, you know, the, you're, if you really believe it, then, then there's no, uh, you know, instrumental problem. You, you're, you're acting on your beliefs, or you or your followers, either way, are acting on your beliefs. But I think the, the crime here is in the belief, uh, you know, that, that's, that's, the, that's the problem. Yeah, well, the last statistics I've seen was 68% of Republicans uh, say they think the election was rigged, that that Biden is is an illegitimate president. Trump belongs back in the White House. And, you know, some smaller percentage of those think he'll be there, you know, this fall or whatever. Actually, it was last fall. Uh, but maybe maybe they're not that delusional, but maybe they think, well, in 2024, we'll correct this error and then he'll return to his rightful place. Do they really believe that? Does, you know, someone like a Ted Cruz, who's obviously not a dummy, um, does he really believe that or is he just mouthing that because it supports the tribe, he gets more support from his followers, and he knows Trump is listening. So, uh, you know, is it an instrumental delusion, yeah. and he's just going along with it? Again, we don't we don't know what is in his heart, but it, but it, I think I would say that you're you're pointing in the right direction. That in his case, you know, it's he's it's an instrumental you know problem, not a not a belief problem, not an epistemic problem, and uh, but he obviously is getting quite a bit of reward for it in the moment uh you know i don't know how history will will treat him but uh but yeah that that's uh that's an interesting way to separate it out in, in his case and in a number of the politicians cases it's clear that they know the truth uh they are just saying what needs to be said for their tribe yeah in terms of determining what is actually true which you and i also care about not just why people believe these things but but what's actually true, what we should believe, justified true belief. You know, a um, certain amount of it is based on, I wouldn't say faith, but confidence in the system that somebody who has access to and the resources to check the ballots in, I don't know, Macon County, Georgia, you know, and, and you know, did you see that video of that grainy video of the truck pulling up at three in the morning with the ballot boxes and, you know, they were flipping for Biden right then. And, you know, I no, I have no idea. I wouldn't even know who to call in Macon County, Georgia, but the Department of Justice does. So when someone like uh, Attorney General Barr says, you know, we looked into this, not just that one, but you know, hundreds of these claims, and we didn't find any evidence for fraud, 
Now, why should I, why would I believe him and not, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene say, well, because I have more confidence in the authority, It's not an argument from authority. It's just that that's their job. And if anybody was going to find fraud because he's a Republican and a Trump supporter, it'd be him. And he says no fraud. So that ups my kind of epistemic confidence that, that there was no fraud. Right, exactly. And, and, uh, and the problem is, is that there, for a gr- some group of people, some people, you know, there is no one who is an authority anymore. You know, that, that obviously I would imagine that many Trump supporters listening even to Bill Barr, who obviously went out of his way to become attorney general and, and was very loyal to Trump for much of his time, uh, you know, the, the minute he turns, you know, he can't be trusted. And so you're right. There's a lot of I think that that one of the biggest problems that we face right now in the larger, you know, societal picture is that uh, for some people, there are no trustworthy authorities. There is no evidence. Everything can be explained away if it's inconsistent with what I want to believe. It's, it's really motivated reasoning, you know, very large scale. Yeah. Well, I like to think that I can trust some sources. Maybe I'm a little skeptical now of, say, MSNBC and Fox News. And, and you know, they, they, they report the same story, and, and, and it's like they're talking about two different things when I flip back and forth on any given night. But I, I trust someone like 60 Minutes, you know, when they send their correspondence there with, you know, reams of notes that, you know, they have teams of researchers and they know what they're doing. They have fact checkers. And, you know, I'd like to think we can still trust that. But the problem seems to be that, especially on the right, they don't trust any of the media. Or That's the right. Mainstream yeah. Media. That's right. That's right. And uh, so, so you know, they, they only go to their own, you know, little echo chamber. And and I think that's, you know, it's a, it's a very bad situation. I mean, the statistic you mentioned about the number of people who believe or say they believe that Trump won mm-hmm. is just frightening. You know, that's uh, there's no evidence to support that whatsoever. As you know, there's a big debate in, in um, between, you know, like evolutionary psychologists and cognitive psychologists and so on about to what extent our senses evolved for veridical perception. That is to say, you know, we, we, we do have an accurate um, understanding of nature, the world, and that that's the purpose of senses is to give us an accurate understanding of reality. And others people say, no, no, the whole point is just to whatever it takes to get your genes in the next generation. You can be totally delusional and completely misperceive the world. It doesn't matter. Whatever whatever the reality in your head that leads to you most likely to succeed in passing your genes on to the next generation, that's what's going to evolve. So let's start there uh, in terms of your usefulness of delusions. Yeah, I, I mean, I would have to say I'm I'm in the second camp. I... I think that you know evolution is the final judge, and uh, you know you, whether whether you get to the next day or not is really the only test. Uh, and I think we're lucky, you know, we have we have been able to really do well with the the cognitive abilities that we have, and reason and evidence and logic have all paid off quite well. Our lifespans are much longer than they were before we started using this kind of uh, logic and reason. And for obvious reasons, uh, and so you you know that you can't argue with that. I mean, that a longer lifespan seems to be a good thing, no matter what. Uh, just, of course, you know, the, the end of life is a whole other question. But but um, so but the thing is, is that that there are we were we were you know behaving and evolving species long before we had these big brains and. And could do all the things that that we do now, and and of course there is the there is the downside that our brains may end up being our, our undoing, right? I mean we we are uh, we are capable of destroying this planet now, which I don't think there's any other species that can make that that claim, and so so uh, there's a there's a double edged sword to the to reason, but I, I'm still I'm still in the reason camp, generally speaking, as as I assume you are too. But uh, but as I said, this this project was one of sort of acknowledging that there are some aspects of our psychology that don't really conform to our sort of standard views of rationality and 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 making sense. And yet they do make a kind of sense because they help us or help the people that employ them. Not everything in the book is something that everyone would you know use or 
or applies to everyone. There are a few things that apply to everyone at the end of the book, uh, but but uh, but a number of the people who employ, for example, superstitions or who are overconfident about themselves in certain situations, those people are are going to benefit uh, in some contexts, and and so you know that that's what the project is about. Right. Yeah. Okay. So maybe an example would be an entrepreneur who wants to do a startup and hope to get it to the point where they get an IPO or they get bought out by a major corporation and they retire as as uh, <laughs> as billionaires or multi hundreds of millions of dollars. How many people actually get that? Not many. You know, it's like uh, venture capitalists tell me that they you know for every one hundred pitches they hear, they fund let's just say ten ten percent. And for, for all those they fund, maybe 10 are successful, the rest go out of business. And of those that are successful, um, you know, nine out of 10 of those just kind of purr along and, 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 and barely make a profit. And only one of them, you know, makes an IPO where the venture capitalists get the massive payoff. And, you know, so it's, it's a pretty small percent. But if you knew that, if you kind of, if you started off thinking, well, what are my chances? Rationally, I shouldn't even bother. So it's a good thing that people actually don't do those calculations because then no one would take the risk, right? Uh, exactly. And, and so that's kind of a rational, yeah. Is that a rational irrationality? Uh, it is to a degree. I think that, uh, you know, the, I do talk about starting businesses in the book. And and I think that the beginning of an enterprise can be quite dangerous if you're if you're irrational about it, if you're overconfident, that, that uh, especially if there's a big downside. I mean, the obvious example is starting a war. Right. Like there have been so many examples of wars that were started like, oh, this will be, you know, a, a walk in the park. Right. And 20 years later, you're still slogging away. And so so uh, th when there's a real downside, uh, I think overconfidence can can be a problem. Uh, but but you're right. I mean, in a way, uh, I guess we sort of accept a certain number of, of failures. I mean, a scientist is the same way. Right. You you do the experiments and you fail a lot. Uh, you hope that it doesn't cost you your whole career, but uh, but in the but there th without that kind of confidence in yourself, which may not be entirely realistic, you certainly wouldn't go forward. Uh, I think that where the overconfidence in a business or some other enterprise like that is most valuable is after you've you've launched it, right? In, in order to keep going, in order to wake up each day and say, yes, I can succeed. I know it looks tough, but that's where the motivational value of overconfidence, I think really can benefit. But the, but the starting point can be dangerous. You know, the, the launching moment, uh, entering the market can be dangerous. Right, so we're glad, glad to have the Elon Musks of the world out there just, you know, throwing stuff at the wall and see what sticks. But, you know, there's a survivorship bias that, you know, he's the one that made it. You know, what right. about all the garage startups, you know, the, 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 the Steve Jobs and the Bill Gates who failed? You know, there must have been tons of them in the 70s. And they still live at their parents' house or whatever because they never <laughs> succeeded in the business. You know, went out of business in the, in the garage. Um, and, and, you know, we don't see that. I mean, when the Elizabeth Holmes story broke about uh, Theranos, uh, you know, and they was like, oh, well, she was bullshitting and exaggerating. It's like, don't they all do that? Isn't that what yeah. you're supposed to do? You yeah. Know, you, you go pitch some venture capitalists. You got to, you know, make the best pitch you can. It's like, oh, this is going to be revolutionary. We're going to change the world. We're going to be able to do all these tests with a single drop of blood and so on. And But I guess the difference would be there. She, uh, so here's the difference maybe between bullshitting and lying, maybe she, or exaggerating or being mm -hmm. overconfident and actually deceiving investors, you know, which it becomes yes. fraud. Yes, she did. She did do that. And uh, and, you know, they gave her an awful lot of money, I guess, you know, based on very little to show for it. So, uh, I'm, you know, that 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 I, I think that the overconfidence or, the, or may have been on the side of the investors more than her. You know, the the crime, uh, you know, the, the the error was on their side more than it was on her side, although obviously cheating, you know, lying is, lying is a bad thing. You know, that, that is, you know, not, not, not telling the truth about your success is a bad thing. Yeah. Right. So the liar knows what the truth is and is purposely distorting it. Whereas the bullshitter just doesn't even care. It doesn't matter what the truth is. It's just, you're just throwing stuff out there. Like, yeah. like, uh, Bannon, like Trump's, Trump's advisor, Steve Bannon famously said, we're just going to throw shit at the system. Uh, and no one will know what to think. 
and and that right. worked. I mean, back to where we started with the rigged election conspiracy theory and all that stuff. You know, it was there wasn't a specific goal. I mean, because Trump lies even when he doesn't gain anything from it. It's almost like he's just throwing shit out there just to confuse people. Like I don't know what to believe. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a, a big supporter of Harry Frankfurt's view of bullshit that, you know, it, that the bullshitter doesn't care. Uh, it, they are just saying what they need to say to get by in the moment. And I also believe, like Frankfurt, that that's worse than lying, you know, because, because you know, the standard of truth is no, nowhere in that, in that calculus. What I think wasn't anticipated by his analysis is what appears to be a, a real effort to just destroy the whole idea of truth, uh, you know, entirely, and to suggest that uh, that you know my truth is just as good as yours, you're wrong just because I say you are, etc. Uh, so yeah, it, it, I think that Trump and, and and not just Trump, but but many people have recently taken a bullshit to another whole level. Right, Trump's. I've been writing about conspiracy theories for my next book, and Trump's conspiracy theory is that. Uh, there is no evidence. Uh, you don't have to present mm -hmm. evidence. Just people are saying is the evidence. I mean, as you know, because you deal with these people, you know, the flat earthers, the creationists, they all have arguments. Right. You know, if you listen to yeah. them, they'll rattle off why, you know, climate science is a hoax or the Holocaust didn't happen or, you know, the creationism argument, the earth is flat. Here's my 20 reasons. Go ahead and try <laughs> to refute them. But Trump just says uh, people are saying that's it. That's the evidence. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. People are saying like okay yeah they say a lot of things but <laughs> that's not that's you know <laughs> yeah. it, it's almost as though you know yeah. you you people are saying this so you don't really want to be left out right because that's what they're saying and don't you want to be part of that group uh it's 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 right. bad very bad yeah yeah which people oh a lot of people <laughs> oh okay <laughs> You yeah. have on the cover this the, the famous Mueller Liler illusion. Yes, probably misstated that, but the the one line looks longer than the other, and it's pretty pretty obvious why, and and yet even knowing why, it's still you know it's still there. Um, so just talk for a minute about like allu like perceptual illusions that psychology one on one courses are are famous for presenting to students, and and we all laugh at how foolish our senses are to be tricked, but in a way it, it's not really irrational. I mean that our Perceptual systems are designed in a particular way that if you're a clever illusionist, you can fool it. So it's not the fault of the uh, the perceiver; it's really the cleverness of the uh, of the presenter or the magician or or the illusionist. Right, and that's and that's part of the reason why. I mean, I use the the Mueller liar uh, illusion is in the book as well, uh, and. I use it as an analogy, but but I, I didn't want to use, you know, many of the things that I talk about in the book could be thought of as illusions, illusions. But the thing about an illusion is it really is in the stimulus much more than it is in the person. You know, we are we have designed ourselves in a way that works, you know, or evolution has uh, designed us in a way that works well. And so these illusions are designed in a way to sort of create an odd effect uh, with, you know, in relation to us. Um, but the but the things I'm talking about in the book are are meant to be the ideas that you know you're being governed by a bad idea, uh, an idea that logically is not making sense, uh, and yet you know it it is obviously benefiting you in, in some degree. So so the reason I the reason I brought up uh, Mueller liar is that there are some delusions that I talk about in the book that seem to be built in that are. That are part of us and are not, uh, you know, in, they're not things that you could be talked out of uh, very easily. So, some, some of them, you know, for example, being overconfident, uh, you know, there, that's that's either going to be something you are or you aren't. It's possible that you could become more confident. You know, there are coaches and ways to do that, but it's not necessarily a built-in thing that that you would be that you would be overconfident in a business situation, for example. Other delusions that are in the book uh, are, are seem to be much more a part of our nature, like Mueller liar, that you can't get rid of it. You can't be talked out of it. Uh, you know, as you know, you look at that illusion, you know why it, it looks the way it does, and it doesn't matter. It still looks that way. Uh, so, so that was part of the reason for, for putting it in the book. But, but uh, I agree with you. I, I think that illusions are, 
are, are different in the sense that they, they uh, you know, they are more external. They're more, it's not like, like you're operating on a bad idea. In fact, in fact, the thing that makes the illusion is probably a good part of our, our, our nature. Yeah, here I was uh, thinking as an, an analogy, as you do, um, to the irrationalities that uh, Tversky and Kahneman have famously uh, exposed. You know, if you present subjects with certain problems, they always get it wrong. You mm -hmm. know, like these medical diagnoses problems or, or estimating probabilities or even simple ones like the ball and bat or the, you know, the iPhone, the, the, you know, the phone and the case together cost $110. The phone yes. costs a hundred dollars more than the case. How much does the case cost? And everybody, oh, it has to yeah. be ten dollars. No, it's five dollars. And, and, <laughs> and you know, even even now when I present this, I have to kind of like, wait, wait, what? How can it be? Oh, what's that's the right. right. I have to remind myself. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, what's the right yeah. answer? And you know, as you know, Gert Gingerinzer kind of countered that, saying, "Well, that's really not fair. You're tricking your subjects into being irrational by presenting it in a certain way. Their heads are getting turned by those round numbers, one hundred dollars." One hundred ten dollars, ten dollars. You know, if you made it some weird number, you know, seventy three dollars and forty six cents. You know, they, they'd be more rational in calculating it, and that re really we're not that irrational. Right, right. And 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 once it's exposed, you know, we do recognize that it it's a mistake. And uh, and I think that I mean the 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 thing about um, the Kahneman and Tversky project is that they did reveal things that that we do that we shouldn't do. Right. That should that should be. I mean, Michael Lewis referred to it as the undoing project. Right. And uh, and so, uh, you know, that that was a that was the goal. In other words, they they sort of believed in the standard economic model that we should be maximizing all the time and making rational decisions. Uh, and they found a number of ways in which we violated that. And so. So that was their goal, uh, and, the, and the and the difference here in this project that I'm on at the moment is that we shouldn't probably undo it. You know, we, these are these are things that don't make sense. We can, in some cases, recognize that they don't make sense, but uh, but it's not clear that that it should be undone in any way. And uh, and so so that's the difference. Yeah, I think. Was it Gingerinzer or somebody called that bounded rationality that right. you know, presented in a certain way in a certain context? Humans are pretty good reasoners. We're not we're not hopelessly irrational, and therefore you know your your work and mine and others you know can make a difference if we address these issues in a particular way that uh, finds the underlying rationality behind it. Um, I was thinking about this another one of the Tversky Kahneman ones. If if you walk into a store and an item is a hundred bucks. And you find out that it's fifty dollars at the store six blocks down. Would you make the walk? And most people go, yeah, yeah, fifty bucks. You know, it's half off. Yeah, I'll do it. Right. But if you walk into the store and the item's a thousand dollars and it's nine hundred fifty dollars at the store six blocks away, you think, well, why bother? It's only fifty yeah. bucks. You know, well, it's the same fifty bucks, but really in context, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it doesn't sound like as much. So you know, first game kind of said, well, that's kind of an irrationality. You know, it's it's the um, I forget what they called that the uh, uh, um, uh, the avail not the availability but the uh, you know the, the kind of w where you rattle off a number in your head like what's your last two digits of your social security number how many restaurants do you think there are in New York City oh, yeah. people yeah. with high two digit numbers you know, and make make higher estimates but that's right. such a weird problem to present people it's, it doesn't seem fair to say that that makes humans irrational. Right, I would agree. I mean, the, some of those examples, you, you know, you can think about it. In in one, on one level, they are irrational. Uh, clearly, it's the same fifty dollars, but but the ratio does matter. And and you know, like if you're taking, that's why, for example, you know, they always hit you with undercoating on your new car just as you're about to sign a loan. You know, if, if you buy it with a loan, or or you're about to shell out, you know, a huge sum of money because uh, because I always thought that if if, if someone were, after you bought the car, you know, the example is if a week later, some guy came knocking on your door and said, I could put some undercoating on your car now for $500, like no one would, no one would do that, right? No. But but pairing it right. with the large expenditure of the car, uh, they can get away with it. And uh, so, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, I don't see those as being terribly 
troublesome, you know, forms of irrationality because there's a way in which uh, $50 is not always $50, right? I mean, that's part of what they also, what Kahneman and Tversky also showed was that a $50 gain is quite different from a $50 loss, for example. And so, so it, the relative sums do matter in some kind of psychological way that I don't think is entirely crazy. So, you know, one of the ways in which Kahneman yeah. and Tversky's work does relate very much to what I'm doing here is the system one, system two, uh, in that, that there are a number of things that we do. I mean, just in the case of self-control, you know, there are, case, there are situations in which the person on one level knows that what they're about to do is probably bad judgment, and yet they, they're going to do it anyway, right? They, their, their intuition or their, you know, whatever is going, to, is going to let them do that. And so there are a number of these delusions where, uh, where you have that double consciousness, where you, you know, for example, I mean, the, I open the book, as you know, with the example of uh, Joan Didion uh, and, and her year of magical thinking, in which she believed for a time, or she claimed that she believed that her husband was going to come back after he died. Um, the first night that, that uh, af- of his death, she uh, insisted on sleeping alone in their apartment in New York because she believed he was going to come back. Uh, and she kept that belief for quite a while. So, so she's quite, you know, the, the book is quite wonderful. And she is very clear about the fact that, you know, I know I, I supervised his cremation. I, you know, put his ashes in, in the crypt. Uh, I know on one level that this is not going to happen, but I still feel like he's going to come back. And so that's that kind of system one, system two conflict that Kahneman and Tversky talk about. And I think it does apply to some of the delusions that I write about in the book. Yeah, especially the ones about death and so on. I'll get to that in a few minutes. But just a few other examples came up, like loss aversion, you know, that losses hurt twice as much as gains feel good. And, you know, when Tversky and Kahneman present these and, and, or the behavioral economists uh, show, you know, well, we're not really rational calculators, you know, we're not utility maximizers, but there's an underlying logic to loss aversion. That is, you know, the negativity bias and how we notice negative things more than positive things. And, you know, there's a whole suite of research on this showing that, you know, you get 100 likes on Twitter but one, and one negative comment, you know, that one sticks out a lot. Well. The reason for that is because there's more ways for things to go wrong than to go right. And, you know, we evolved this cognition to pay attention to bad things because bad things will take you out of the gene pool. <laughs> and there's right, way exactly. more ways for things to go, go south than, than, than to go get better. And most progress is made, you know, incrementally, day by day, you hardly notice it. But, you know, one catastrophic fall car accident, heart attack, stroke, you know, you're gone. So, right. you know, you have to really pay attention to the negative thing. So there is a rationality to something like loss aversion. Definitely is. I mean, they, you know, they had a they had sort of an easy time. I, I, you know, I should say this about Nobel Prize winning psychologists, but but they had an easy time in the sense that they were they were arguing against a model that was, you know, too that portrayed us as too rational, right? As, as you know, they were, they were going against standard economic theory where, you know, an, you know, a loss is a loss and a gain is a gain. And, and so it, they were, in some sense, some of the examples, once they hit on them, it was like shooting fish in a barrel. But I'm not, I'm with you in the sense that obviously uh, if, you're, if you're out, you know, scrabbling across the, the tundra trying to survive as some kind of species, uh, you know, not getting another bit of food in this minute is not quite as drastic as being hit by a predator in that moment. So, so you're right. I mean, losses in in, in the sort of uh, in the sort of survival mechanism mode, losses have a much stronger effect in in many instances. And so, it's not it's not surprising that we uh, that we pay attention to them. Yeah. Or take something like the sunk cost fallacy, you know, where you're not supposed to uh, stay in a in a failing business too long, and people do that, or a, a bad marriage, or you know, what are your investment tool, or whatever it is that 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 you're 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 staying in too long, or a bad war, right? You know, we should have cut and run out of Afghanistan and, and Iraq much earlier than we did, 
But, you know, we, we didn't want to, you know, sacrifice those people who had lost their lives and, and just give up on the war. So and this is all treated as it, it's irrational to stay in a bad marriage. Well, or a bad business. But in fact, you know, marriages are up and down. They're rocky. And, and, you know, part of the thing that makes a successful marriage is staying together through the hard parts and not just cutting and run and not right. just bail. So, you know, that, that sunk cost in, in, in many cases can be valuable. So how do you know when you're being foolish and staying too long in a business or a marriage or war and, and when you should cut and run? Yeah, I th- I think the sunk cost fallacy has been sort of battered. Uh, you know, there are a number of ways in which people have argued that it's not um, th- that it's not always a fallacy to keep going. You know, th- there's there's a there one of the classic examples involves uh, a company building a a uh, radar invisible plane, and just at the last moment, some other competing company beats them to it. Uh, should they complete their plane or not? Right, uh, and uh, and you know, the, the, to me, if you're the company, you at least may want to show that you can complete a project and that you know you were beaten out on this case. But here's my product; it's a good product. It may not be competitive, but but it, now now maybe they'll be funded to do something else. So there are there are reasons uh, where I think sunk costs are are um, uh, you know are not a bad thing. And the, and the other thing is that, as you say, a lot of the research is done on these very discrete kinds of examples that are, are designed to show, you know, a fallacy of some kind. And the real life cases are far, far more complicated than that, obviously. Yeah. Like the marshmallow test, you know, that you're, you're supposed to delay gratification, wait the 15 minutes, get your two marshmallows. And those children end up having you know, better grades in school, higher SAT scores, but, you know, they graduate from college more, they have better marriages, they make more money in a lifetime and so on. So that the message is delay gratification. Yeah, well, what if you're in a in an environment, let's say a home with a bunch of different kids, and if you wait 15 minutes for the second marshmallow, <laughs> you won't even get the first one because it'll be, it'll be eaten before you get to it. And yeah. so really it's better to act now uh, right. Rather than you know, to, you know, what is that? The, the bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Take what you have now. Don't delay gratification. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I understand all the the follow up data on those kids and what's supposed to have happened to them, you know, and so on. But, but the the whole question of self control is a fraught one. I wrote a whole book, you know, on on finance and self control. And, uh, and, you know, m- many times, and I would argue that in many of our worst problems are problems of self-control. You know, we burn fossil fuels now, not caring what the planet will look like later, uh, and other things of that nature. And health problems are often ones of immediate gratification versus later health. Um, but, uh, but, you know, th- there's also you know, a-, a view that, like, if, I'm, if I want this thing now, then I am maximizing my my reward at least in the moment, and so I think there are some some you know, there there's some debate that is it's not always the case that the long term reward is the best one. Many people work towards a long term reward and later regret that they didn't do something earlier and so on. So so some of those some of those problems are not as straightforward as as they look. Yeah, saving up for the best 90th birthday party anyone ever had, and you keel over dead at 89, was probably yeah, not a wise decision. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, there's some <laughs> there's some balance there. You know, you, it, most people don't save enough, as, you know, research shows, right? Uh, yeah. I don't know what percent, 40% of Americans when they retire will have no money in, you know, in mm-hmm. savings for retirement. And wow, okay. So obviously that's a problem on one end, but on the other hand, you know, if you if you just kind of scrimp and save and you don't enjoy yourself in your 20s, 30s and 40s and you get to your 60s and 70s. and Wow, I really missed out on a lot of things I would have liked to do. So there's some balance in there. And that's I guess it's hard to say what the balance is because it's so personal. But you know, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree. I mean, it, and, it, and the thing is, is that we we are not, you know, we are not able to see the future. It's a funny thing, you know, but. But if you live long enough, you you're not the same person as you were when you were younger, and whatever those initial goals were, um, you know they change over time. So uh, so I yeah I I think that this is why I I would argue that uh, people who are impulsive and who 
who are hedonists uh, in the moment, uh, they may have a rational reason for that, and and they may have taken the future into account in doing so. This is what you know. I mentioned in the book that Gary Becker had a theory of rational addiction. You know, the idea that cigarette smokers, the cigarette smokers had actually taken into account their potential future expense and discomfort of bad health as they're smoking now. Um, I think that's kind of a hard sell. Uh, I don't know whether that's true. And there's there's a tremendous amount of evidence that smokers end up regretting their their decision to start smoking. Um, but, uh, but, you know, th- clearly some people are saying, you know, I would rather enjoy this moment now than worry too much about what it brings in the future. And that seems reasonable to me. Yeah, it's like in the heyday of the low calorie uh, research that, you know, m- mice live twice as long when they're on a super low calorie diet, almost a starvation that you're just always hungry. You know, so a lot of people went through this. And, you know, to me, they, I knew some of these people, they always looked miserable and unhappy. <laughs> it's yeah. like, why don't you just eat a full meal and just be satisfied? <laughs> oh, no, because I want, you know, because in, in, in 70 years, I get to live an extra 10 years. Yeah, but the 70 years of being constantly hungry, that doesn't seem like a quality of life. So there's, again, some balance there. Definitely, definitely. And I, and the other thing is, is that I'm always encouraged by the fact that I know a number of people who, if you looked at them, you wouldn't think they were particularly healthy, but they've lived long lives. So so uh, there's always that, uh, not undoubtedly a bias sample, you know, and not a, not a scientific study, but. Talk a little bit about the debate between William Clifford and William James about truths. I love, I love oh, that story in the book. Yeah. So, so this is an interesting story and I'm, I'm fortunate that I, uh, I took, I, I taught a freshman seminar on skepticism actually, and I co-taught it with a philosopher named Derek Turner, who's a good friend. And he, he taught this debate. So William Clifford was a mathematician and, and philosopher, and he, he really is the hardliner on epistemic rationality on, 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 uh, or what, or what would be called a, you know, a, an, a, an extreme evidentiary position. He felt as though that, that no belief, and we, and we probably know skeptics and people like this actually, no belief should ever be held unless there is sufficient evidence to support it. And, uh, and, he, and he gave this example, uh, which I tell in the book, famous example of the ship owner who he owns a ship. He, he is worried that it's not in good shape. And, and, he, and, he, and you know, there are people who are going to go off to the new land uh, on this ship. Uh, and rather than dealing with the ship and fixing it or anything like that, or keeping it from from going on the trip, he pushes those uh, those worries out of his mind. He he deliberately thinks about something else or thinks optimistic thoughts. Uh, and Clifford would say without sufficient justification. And so then, of course, according to the story, the ship goes off, sinks, tells no tales, as as Clifford says. And uh, and he collects his insurance money, you know, he collects his insurance money and he doesn't feel bad about it because he's pushed the worries out of his mind. And he and Clifford suggests that no matter whether the ship had sailed safely or not, that that man was the ship owner was, uh, you know, guilty of of holding a false belief. And and he, he goes so far as to say that even holding a private belief that is false, that you that's there insufficient evidence for it. Um, that 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 is wrong because it breeds gullibility, and e- even if you do nothing with that belief, it's completely private. It it breeds a, you know gullibility, and it makes other beliefs more more easy to to take in. And uh, so he's he's very str- strict on that, and and obviously it had implications for for uh, religious belief. So along comes William James, you know the famous American psychologist, and and philosopher and he takes on Clifford directly he he calls him sort of a a, a enfant terrible he he, you know, he sort of does a little ad hominem uh, in a in a I think in a in a joking way and but he he suggests that he feels as though some beliefs um, are justified if they uh, you know if you can't get away without you know you can't put them off uh, and if they have important implications, 
uh, then you then you're willing. You know, it's it's okay to believe them uh, if they bring some some benefit. And so so uh, you know, this book represents some examples of the Jamesian position. James, of course, you know, you know, um, you know, he he was a believer in the afterlife, and he. He was a founder of the of a spiritualist society, and both here and in England, and he did also, um, you know, expose some some fraudulent spiritualists. But he believed in the possibility of communicating with the dead, and uh, and he got into trouble, you know, with a number of his writings uh, the, with his more skeptical psychological colleagues. Um, but but uh, you know there's a pragmatism to his view, right? The he was a pragmatist philosopher, and he his view is similar to the one I mentioned of of Jonathan Barron, psychologist uh, at Penn, who who suggests that even if you break the rules of logic, if it benefits you, and so so this book you know this book is sort of exploring some of those Jamesian beliefs that that or 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 close to what would be Jamesian beliefs that. Are not necessarily consistent with evidence and, and logic, but they have some benefit for the individual. Yeah, yeah, I love that because in in our world of skepticism and humanism and the rationality community, let's call it, um, you know, one of our founding heroes was Martin Gardner, uh, who uh, right. you know was famously a fideist. And, you know, here this guy is such a hard-nosed skeptic. I mean, he wrote hundreds and hundreds of columns and articles and many books debunking all manner of just total bullshit, psychic power, people talking to the dead, on and on and on. But he himself said he believed in God, that there yeah. is an afterlife, prayer matters, believes in free will, and so on. And he even said, look, I think the atheists have better arguments than theists do for God's existence. But nevertheless... Because you can't prove there is no God, and it makes me yeah. feel good. It works right. for me. I'm not trying to tell you what to believe. I'm not trying to say I can prove anything at all. Uh, I'm just saying this is in a different category. So maybe if we think of it as like different kinds of truths, you know, empirical truths, which would be your, your epistemic side, versus, I don't know what, mythic truths or religious truths or metaphorical truths because they work. And I know yeah. a lot of skeptics are like, oh, you know, poor Martin. And uh, even Randy was like, well, that's this side of Martin. We'll just forgive him that because he's such a good skeptic otherwise. But yeah. which, uh, if I follow in your argument, you're saying n not just say, oh, that was just his silly delusional side of himself. But there is a, an underlying kind of logic to it or, or rationality to it. Or a pragmatic one, right? That he, that he, he by his yeah. own, by his own uh, testimony, he is benefiting from it. And like I, I that to me is you know it, I wouldn't go there. I mean that's not you know I'm not that person. Uh, I I don't believe uh, in God or afterlife or any of those things. But but uh, but at the same time, there's you know, I'm also a scientist, and so so the evidence suggests that people who are religious gain there are benefits to it. There you know the the evidence is kind of. Strange, but within, but within, you know, people who are religious give more to charity, including non-religious charities. They benefit; they're happier, you know. So, so like, I mean, as I say, I would not be that person. I, I, I can't. I just wasn't brought up that way. Uh, it doesn't make sense to me. But I understand that these people get some benefit from it. So, so as I say, I this is this is a project in part in, of humility, you know, and and acknowledging the factual evidence that supports what they are doing. And uh, the factual evidence isn't in the God, in, in the spiritual theory, uh, but it's in what the benefits are for, for them. So, But we want to be careful not to go down the road of, uh, of sort of an elitism in which we say, well, the little people need religion, you know, like... <laughs> I, no. I'm not sure Dan Dennett would go along with this, but Dan has that idea of belief and belief. I don't believe in God, but I believe that people believe in God, and that's good for them. And, and it, I wouldn't say, I'm not sure about this, about Dan, but a lot of atheists are like this. You know, well, the little people need it. You know, they're irrational. But we smart people don't need this. You're arguing quite something quite different than that. Yeah, I, 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 would, I would not, you know, it's been my, my view that you get, you get further no matter what you're trying to get across, what you're trying to persuade people, you get 
you get further with that project if you treat them, you know, the same as you would yourself. If you if you respect their views, uh, and uh, you know, it, it, we've been challenged in that respect with some some of the Trump supporters, but but nonetheless, you know, I think if you really want to try to convince someone uh, a, a, and to understand them, you have to think of them at, at your own level. So I don't I don't take it that way. And there are other other things, you know, for example, you know, th there are the the overconfidence, you know, I, I some people are going to be that way or not, uh, both in health situations and in work situations and in uh, interpersonal situations. Uh, it, you know, that I see that the same way. We, we're all the product of our our upbringing. You know, I was fortunate that neither of my parents were particularly religious growing up. And so it just came naturally to me that I was not either. And, uh, and I also over time developed an interest in science. So, so it all came together very naturally for me. Um, and I hope that I'm getting the same kinds of benefits that a religious person might in other ways. But, um, but, you know, so I, I see it as just sort of individual differences in that respect, um, uh, rather than the little people. I, I think I think the skeptic and, and atheist communities that have done some harm by coming off as elitist uh, often. Right. So let's make some good arguments here on that side. You and I don't know, we're atheists, but we don't know that there's no God. Uh, you can't prove a negative. And in any case, you know, these kind of ultimate uh, questions about what was there before the Big Bang, where the universe come from, why is there something rather than nothing? We have arguments for these, but they're not, you know, drop dead full proof arguments. At some point, we all hit an epistemological wall. We don't know what was there. What, what time was it before there was time? Well, what do you? I don't even know what you're talking about. Oh, or you know, if, if there's nothing, how could there be something? Well, what is nothing? You know, what does that even mean? And when you drill down, it just becomes uh, trapped in a language, kind of a. Wittgensteinian uh, cognitive, uh, uh, you know, just restrictions based on what we mean by words. So would it be reasonable to say, look, I, you know, you don't know if there's a God, and I don't either for sure. Nobody does. But, you know, it, there's these ultimate uh, questions, and this is how I choose to answer them. You, you can answer them some other way, but nobody knows, so it's okay to believe, just in case. And same thing with the afterlife. You know, I don't know that there's no afterlife. I doubt it, but, you know, I... I'm, as I tell people, I'd be happy to just wake up and open my eyes after I've closed them for the final time. And wow, I'm in this, you know, quantum field or whatever it would be. And there's Deepak Chopra and Carl Sagan and Stephen Jay Gould and all my friends that are gone and my parents are there. And oh, wow. OK, that'd be fine. Uh, although I, 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 you know, like Christopher Hitchens famously said of the Christian heaven, you know, it's like celestial North Korea. You know, you don't want this dictator <laughs> that knows all your thoughts and controls everything. That, that doesn't sound paradisiacal to me. But what right. if it is? It's a, I don't know that that's not the case. Could be, you know. So I'm, I'm although I'm an atheist and I don't believe in the afterlife, I, I'm just willing to say, okay, well, maybe, yeah, it could be. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we all engage in forms of wishful thinking. You know, it's like you know it, 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 that we hope that something is going to happen and it sustains us. Again, so you you have to look. I think as a psychologist, you often have to look at what is the what is the the effect in the moment, right now, not in the future of these kinds of beliefs and they are comforting you know the the one of the things that comes through you know in in the study of religion and you know, over time is that people love to be a part of a story you know there the narrative is an extremely powerful thing for us makes us feel as though we're part of something larger than ourselves right uh and uh, and for some people the scientific explanations are cold and sort of you know unfeeling uh, and so, so I can see the appeal, and and hopefully, you know, when their religion butts up against, you know, health and science, you know, in their everyday lives, they they take the scientific path rather than faith healing yeah. or some other thing. But, but I don't, mm -hmm. I don't, I can understand as a psychologist, I certainly can understand why these things, uh, you know, evolved and. And especially as um, if you brought up with them, you know, if you, if you were brought up under the sway of these things, I think the person who makes the the left turn uh, in either direction, uh, well, I guess you can only make a left turn in one direction, but the, that the person <laughs> who makes 
the person who makes the turn, uh, you know, has a, has had a different experience and and is probably more yeah. rare. Yeah, that's why I, I call UFOs uh, deities for atheists or sky gods right. or skeptics, because yeah. so much of the narrative surrounding the you know, even from the SETI program. Uh, the arguments that you know we're not alone. You know you 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 grind through the Drake equation. It's like they have to be out there. But there's an another element I, I I think in there that that we're not alone. That there's somebody out there that's more advanced, more moral than us, and knows we're here. Right. And that right. feels like almost like a religious impulse. Sure. And all that science fiction stuff, right? That that fits in with that that idea of we're going to go out and explore and find those Wookiees or whatever they are that are out there. That, that is a kind of a sense of a, 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 almost a religious impulse. Do you think that could be in our nature, something like that? I, I think it's very likely. I mean, it's just so common. And there is that sense of, again, wanting to be part of a story, right? That, that even if the story is that we're here and there's these other people out there that we could, or other creatures out there that we could connect with, I think it's 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 something that we you know as our as social beings, uh, it's it, it is scarier to be alone, uh, and it would be nice to be a part of a picture that is very large. That is that is not just our mundane everyday sort of sort of thing. And so uh, yeah, I, I it seems to be it seems to be part of our nature. What is your opinion of terror management theory, which I'm sure you're familiar with that? You know, the fear of death is what drives human creativity and civilization and just this desire to leave behind something after we're gone and we're the only species that knows we're going to die. Therefore, we have this impulse. What are your thoughts on that research? Well, I mean, I'm not I'm not a, a, a major proponent of that idea at all. I do think that we are we are aware. I mean, there's no question that we are aware of our deaths. And, and that is a unique thing about us. The existentialists, you know, had something to say about that. But um, but and we are, I think, motivated by the fear of death in many cases. And, the number, for example, many of the negative superstitions that have evolved uh, are ones that are aimed at avoiding, you know, these these losses. And uh, I personally be believe that we would be better off if no one had taught us those. But I understand the motivation that, you know, you see around you people getting sick, people dying, you know, that sort of thing happening. And in many cases, it seems fairly random. So you need some way of making sense out of that. But uh, but as far as the whole terror management theory, I'm not, you know, I'm not uh, a proponent necessarily. I think that we, 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 I think we're a fairly optimistic species most of the time. I mean, over, I mean, there's evidence yeah. to that, to, to that view, right? That, that the, you know, the depressive realism, the idea that depressed people are realistic about their station in life and, and non-depressed people are, are overly optimistic. So, so, um, so that's, I think, a more accurate view myself. Yeah. And finally, I, I loved your discussion of uh, free will and determinism and self-determinism and self-control and, you know, to what extent people uh, are buffeted, uh, buffeted around by forces versus making it themselves. Is brainwashing possible? Can, you know, can anyone have that much control over somebody else? And so on. So uh, just how do you square that circle as a scientist? You, you, you surely agree we live in a deterministic universe, with the exception of quantum <laughs> uncertainties, which yes. don't, don't really affect uh, the macro level that we live at. So, um, and yet, I mean, is it a useful fiction? Is it legitimate to say, I feel like I have free will and it's a useful fiction, it works for me, and that's a legitimate uh, position? A absolutely. I, I believe so. And this is, of course, the, probably the most controversial position in the book, and it's I leave it to the last uh, example in the book. Uh, but I, I, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I read Dan Wegner's book on the illusion of conscious will. He did some really ex interesting research showing that people can be fooled into believing that they either caused something when they didn't cause something to happen or, or that they claim they didn't, as in the case of an Ouija board, I'm not making it move, but you are making it move. You just don't feel it, right? And so once you recognize how easily our senses could be off about that. I mean, the, the, only, the only real evidence 
that people have that they are they have free will is that they feel like it. They uh, they feel like they're doing it, right? I've I've had many discussions with philosophers, most of whom are compatibilists who believe that free will the the idea of free will is not incompatible with determinism, which to me is sort of a Goldilocks solution that I can't quite work out. Um, but uh, but you know that most of them are arguing from the idea that if there weren't free will, we'd be in trouble, right? We couldn't hold people responsible for their actions or give them praise when they do something good. And uh, and I don't you know I don't buy that. I think that I think that we're not that special. You know that we we are you know no one has any problem with most of the universe being billiard balls, right? And just doing its thing in the physical world. Somehow, when you get down to us and maybe a small group of other species, there are special rules, right? It just, that, on a logical sense, that doesn't make sense to me. And then as a psychologist and, and being aware of the research that shows how easily you can be fooled into making a misattribution of, of believing that you caused something when you didn't and so forth, it just seems clear to me that that we don't have it, but it is it is useful. It is useful to have the idea that I, you know, like you're driving your car, the wheel turns and goes off the road. It's useful to know that either you did that, right, because you can feel it, or that it happened without your consciously doing. That's useful information for your survival. And so, uh, so you know, being aware of things that happen in the world that are connected to our bodies, as opposed to some other part of the environment, that's, that's very valuable. And also, there's the social, you know, the social opprobrium, the, the idea that you, f you have the sense that you did something. If you're then held responsible for that action, that makes it possible for guilt and all these other things that will lead to social control. So I think it's a very useful, as, as social animals, it's a very useful uh, delusion that we have. And, uh, but I do, I do fall very firmly in the hard determinist camp. Uh, uh, the other arguments just don't make sense to me. Yeah. Well, I think much turns on, on the question, could you have done otherwise? And this leads to the question, is the universe predetermined? That is that sort of block universe, well, here's the universe from start to finish, and you're in this little slot right here, you're born here, you're dead here, everything that happens in between has already happened. On some other plane, you know, God or whatever knows what everything that ha happened and why. You don't, because you're in the movie, and you're just kind of going along, so you're being buffeted around, you feel like you're, uh, you're making choices, but you're not, so it's a, it's a delusion. But what if that's not the case? What if the universe is not predetermined? That is to say, going forward, you could go left instead of right, or you could make that choice instead of that choice, and you're aware that these forces are buffeting you around. And you actively choose to say, well, okay, I'm going to take control over this temptation. Uh, I know tomorrow morning I'm going to be lazy and not want to get up at six in the morning and put on my workout clothes and I'm going to stumble around because I'm kind of fuzzy. So I'll put my workout clothes ready to go. I'll set the alarm. I've, I've made an arrangement with my buddies to meet him at 7 a.m. at the Dolphins for our bike ride. And I don't want to let him down. And so I, <laughs> I pre-arrange all the conditions knowing future Shermer is going to be a certain way than current Shermer is. And that to me seems like not just a delusion because I don't think the universe is predetermined. I think I can help make the future slightly differently, and you can too, and everybody can, by just kind of moving along in a certain direction by being self-aware that these things uh, are influencing me. Oh, that's great. I love that, that example. The, the, I mean, what I would say, just to poke at it a little bit, is that you came to that behavior, which of course does make it easier to, to do your thing uh, in the morning, uh, but you came to that behavior after, after a long history of various failures, experimenting with your own, you know, with your own behavior and what works and what doesn't. And so, so I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not able to answer the is everything predetermined question, right? Uh, that's, that's, that's above my pay grade, perhaps. Uh, it, 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 is a, it is a daunting idea that, you know, the Big Bang happened 
and then it led directly to our conversation right now, right? Exactly as our conversation is playing out. Uh, that's that's hard to conceive. Uh, but I, I tend to think that um, that there's sufficient evidence, if you're going to choose between these, these various beliefs about free will, there's sufficient evidence on the part of, uh, you know, both psychology and just logic to suggest that we're, we, we don't have it, that it, it is an illusion. Uh, or, I mean, Wegner called it an illusion. I, I'm using delusion, you know, because that's my term for the book. But, but that it's, it's, it's a feeling that we have uh, created by our biology and, uh, and, and it's, and, and part, and I, and I would suggest that it's a feeling that, you know, that we were selected for, right? That, that people who didn't, wouldn't have this feeling, I think is very likely would not do as well as species, you know, uh, and so, so, uh, so I think it's, I think it's a, it's one of the fruits of evolution that, that we benefit from, but it is, it's hard to accept uh, uh, for most people. Our whole culture is built around the idea of volitional action. You know that you 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 did this thing, you get credit for it or you get blamed for it. Uh, it's it, and it's not just it's not just the West. It's it's it seems to be fairly universal. So so um, that's why it's such a sticky. That's why I left it to the end because I knew that it would be the hardest one for people to accept. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I like uh, Dan Dennett's idea of degrees of freedom. So let's use this example. In, uh, let's use a legal example. So, you know, the law recognizes that some people have less control, self-control, than others. Uh, drug addicts, uh, uh, just, I don't know, alcoholism, uh, just a brain tumor. You know, I use these examples of, you know, Mr. Oft, OFT, uh, it was this school teacher who um, uh, all of a sudden his his wife found kitty porn on his computer and he was abusing the stepdaughter and so on. And he, you know, she calls uh, child services and, you know, he's arrested. He's about to go to jail. And, uh, and all of a sudden he pees his pants in front of the psychiatrist or whatever. And she's like, what is going on with this guy? And they scan his brain. He's got a tumor in his ne- next to his hypothalamus. They take the tumor out. His feelings of pedophilia are gone. He doesn't act on it anymore. He says he's fine. And then, you know, six months later, the wife finds some stuff on his computer and they scan the brain again. Oh, the tumor's back. They retract the, resect the the tumor again and his feelings go away. Okay, so, but I don't have those feelings. So what's the difference between that guy who has a tumor and me who doesn't have a tumor? Um, I mean, don't I have more degrees of freedom and he has fewer degrees of freedom? And in that example, we think of him as, not a pedophile, but he's a, a victim of a medical right. problem. Right. Well, I mean, that's that's where I, uh, the, from a social point of view, uh, that's why he would probably not be prosecuted. Was he? Pro- is this a real life case? This is a real it? life case. Yeah. No, uh, I forget. I forget what the outcome was. Uh, I think the tumor kept growing back several times, yeah. and I, I, I don't but, know what he's but doing now. I, but, I suspect yeah. that he would not pr- be, you know, punished. For this, because the cause is not one that's that you know would uh, apply to generally in a social context. In other words, you know, if you or I or anyone else without the tumor engaged in this kind of behavior or some other kind of horrible behavior, then punishing us has some value in that it would deter both us in the future and others to do that. But the, the cases specifically where the law makes exceptions, right, and se- holds you not responsible are exactly those cases where punishments would not possible, would not be treating the problem, would not have any potential, you know, impact. And so, so, uh, so I think there's a sort of sense to it, uh, that it, that in those instances where there's no other explanation that is, that is not part of your nature, right? That your your basic nature. Then, then, uh, then we don't punish, and and uh, we do punish. I mean, and it, it's only in those cases where, you know, punishing this guy would would not really be you know the thing to do. You you need to keep getting his tumor out and uh, and, and recognize that <laughs> right. recognize right. that you know it, he's not doing it as a result of poor upbringing or some other you know, aspect. 
Like in the Middle Ages, when somebody killed somebody else with an axe, they put the guy on trial, and the axe was put on trial. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and animals. Better than that. Pigs were put on trial. <laughs> and, and animals, and, right. And, <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 So, but so another example again back to the could could you have done otherwise you know maybe Mr. Oft could not have done otherwise and and uh, this example comes from Adrian Rain's book uh, the anatomy of violence and he has another example uh, of a guy named Dante Page an African American young man who raped and murdered a woman uh, and and so he spent he was on his defense uh, attor attorneys hired Adrian Rain's to make the case that uh, he was uh, out of control he just had no control not with the tumor, there was no tumor, but that this guy had the worst background you could possibly imagine. You know, born in a, a, of, a of a mom who was addicted to drugs, uh, so it was in the placenta and so on. You know, no dad in the home, a, you know, broken home, living in total, utter poverty in the like crappiest, worst neighborhood with terrible air and water and gangs and no education and dropped on his head multiple times. And Adrian spends like three pages talking about this guy's background, and you end up kind of feeling bad for him. Like, uh, wow, this is the worst luck you could possibly have. But then he describes what he did to this woman, and it's like, oh, my God, this is terrible, right? So what Rain's argument is that, okay, Mr. Off with the tumor, you can see the tumor in a brain scan. He goes, oh, it's a medical condition. It's harder to think of the worst background you could possibly have for 20 years that goes on and on and on of all the things that go, well, that's a medical condition, mm. you know, so that we're not very consistent of how we, you know, kind of treat those different factors that influence it. Not at all. And I, I understand your point. And the, 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 the problem is, is that, you know, and this is why, this is another reason why I believe that we don't have free will is that the, our, the degree to which we attribute free will or choice to a person varies very strongly on the basis of whether how much we want to punish them right you know we we, we if we want to you know if the crime is heinous and 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 a, a revolting to us regardless of how bad the person's background what the other circumstances might be that don't apply to more normal people in that case we still want to we still want to say that person had a choice they and and that is one of the things that that there's lots of uh, experimental philosophy evidence to support that view that that the same action uh, is judged much more harshly and to have been more of a choice more of a free choice in cases when when we really want to punish the person so like that contaminates this whole topic and as far as I'm concerned we can't divorce from our 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 desire to punish people for our own reasons right revenge or whatever uh, uh, from the question of does did this person have an ha, could they have done otherwise as you suggest or did they have a choice and uh, so it's really it's really problematic uh, in terms of uh, trying to reason out specific cases that involve especially punishment you know that that there it's contaminated yeah. by that desire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to move away from extreme cases, let's just say. Um, I cheat on my wife and she catches me. Now, am I going to launch into some argument about, uh, you know, the Big Bang and all the causal <laughs> vectors that led up to this and, and I could not have done otherwise and, you know, it's, it's tumors all the way down. I just, <laughs> my background, my parents were divorced, blah, 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 right. blah, blah. I mean, I wouldn't even finish the sentence before no. I'd get slapped and said, you could have done otherwise and you better not do that again. And I'm right. leaving you any case or whatever the response. Was, I'm not going to do this, but uh, but you know, so there it doesn't feel like. Come on, you, you're really going to make a deterministic argument, <laughs> right? No, I mean, I don't think that. It, 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 my view is that you can make the determin deterministic argument, but my view is that there's still there's still merit in punishing you for it, right? In other words, that that that, that you know, you 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 did this thing after a long history of whatever, right? And you had that moment where you fell. Uh, and, and if I punish you, and if other people see this punishment, you know, in similar cases, they may be, they may learn from that. They may deter themselves in the future and say, I see what happened to Michael. I don't want that, you know? Uh, and so, so I, I think that there are reasons why we've established these these systems of of punishing people in certain social groups, 
uh, that are not about the question of whether they have free will or not. It's it's about it's about learning and it's about creating a social network that discourages behavior that the group does not support. Yeah, but here again, I would I would say, well, but it's kind of wrapped up in language. If I say, you know, going forward, I'm not going to put myself in a position where that temptation happens. So future Shermer. It might be weak, so I'm not going to allow myself to be in a hotel room alone with another woman, something like that. And so I just won't, uh, you know, I won't, now I don't want to go full Mike Pence and say, I will never have dinner with a woman without (laughs) some other, uh, you know, chaperone present. Right. (laughs) You know, which is kind of a sign to me signaling, like, I'm so (laughs) weak-willed that I'm going to fall from grace here if if I'm even in the presence of another woman without uh, another guy (laughs) to kind of look out after me. Wow. All right. Uh, but but in a way, you know, it's kind of, again, back to this, you know, my future self, uh, you know, is that really determined? Well, I feel like it's kind of self-determined. I'm taking some control over my life by saying, I know what could happen, so I'm going to do this instead of that. But well, what's your evidence for that, Michael? I mean, what what makes you, <laughs> well, what makes you feel just, that I'm way? I'm just arguing, Stuart, that <laughs> what makes me feel that it's a kind of delusion. OK, I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> use your word. But the rest of your book is kind of saying there's an underlying logic to the apparent delusion. Mm-hmm. And that logic is, is that it, 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 you can use whatever words you want. It works for me or mm-hmm. it works for us or it gains, it, it increases self-control that if you believe you can make choices, that does give you more self-control. So it's a kind of a positive feedback loop. Isn't that kind of a form of rationality? To believe well, I, that. yeah, I mean, certainly, certainly, that's what I mean. That's sort of the point of the book, right? Is that is that this is a delusion, but it but it helps. It's a helpful delusion, and and so uh, yes, and you know, I I do think that many you know some of the examples you're coming up with are ones where they are strongly in a normal person, not without with tumors, right? But in a, these are situations where you're aware of the fact that there are conflicting impulses that you have, right? That there's the strength of, of wanting to go one direction and other things pulling you in another, and we can be aware of that, you know? Uh, and so the idea is that that awareness that I'm about to take this action, uh, that can be modified so that it has more of a, uh, an anxiety or a, a negative aspect after training. Uh, in a social group. I mean, you know, we all know of certain social groups where people have been so well trained that they wouldn't think of doing certain things that the group disapproves of, right? It just wouldn't even come to mind. Uh, and, and yet other people don't have that same sense. And so I think that combining your sense that I'm about to do this thing, right, with the influ- influence of your social group, that this is a very valuable thing, you know, that, that I feel like I'm about to do this. And if I do, my group is going to jump on me, you know, or, or, or someone's going to jump on me. That really opens the door for a lot of learning, a lot of social control that would benefit not only me personally, actually it's less about me than it is benefiting the group as a whole, other people. So I, it's, I think it's an extremely useful sense that we have. Uh, and, uh, and, I, and I don't think that I'm, it's dangerous to think about it uh, as being an illusion. I think I think it's a useful one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, let's just kind of wrap up. Give us some broad thoughts on uh, on the future of human rationality. You know, we're facing 2024 election, which may not be be believed by either side because there's so much misinformation and conspiracy theories about rigged elections and so on. Who knows what to believe? Um, you know, uh, so that's kind of the dark side. But on the other hand, you know, if you follow the, 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 the kind of the moral arc of the expanding moral sphere and things are getting better and, you know, you and I don't think about Jews and women and blacks like people did 200 years ago. And why not? Well, because we've all had our consciousness raised and, you know, we've, we, you know, we've adopted these new norms and that's good. Are you optimistic about the future or pessimistic or, and, and what do you think we can do about uh, continuing the, the arc of progress? I, I I hate to end on a downer, uh, but I I am somewhat <laughs> very pessimistic. I did I, I I was I'm surprised at how far we have gone. I mean, and also Michael, like here we are. We've been like banging the drum of rationality and reason and evidence for all these years, and it seems like we've gone backwards uh, quite quite drastically. 
So I don't know. I, you can only hope that it's a pendulum that has to swing in one direction and will come back the other way. Uh, and sometimes that does happen. Uh, but I'm, I'm, you know, I, I feel as though I, I would never have said this before, you know, a few years back, but I feel as though the Enlightenment is on shaky ground now. You know, the, the, the basic ideas of, of democracy, of truth, of reason, law, uh, you know, equality, all these ideas are, you know, up for grabs at the moment. And so, uh, I mean, there will always be we, we lonely few who will hold on to them and live our lives that way, right? Uh, but, um, but, but it's still a, a little bit distur discouraging, I think. Well, maybe the way to think about it is it's not guaranteed. You know, the, 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 the arc right. of moral progress is not inevitable. It's not like some Marxian force of history marching along. We, we have to do it, right? right? So we can do it. I mean, right. we, we can turn the ship. I mean, Trump is not president anymore, even though a lot of people think he, he is, but he's not. So the system right. worked. That's right. That's right. That is, <laughs> so there is I, that. I hold on to that. <laughs> I hold on to that. And I also think he's, I think, I mean, if you, if we're going to do prognostication, I think he's, he, he, it would be a mistake for him, for the Republicans, if they want to win, I think it would be a mistake to, to nominate him again. I mean, after all, he is a loser. Uh, he is at this point. So, mm -hmm. but. Mm-hmm. Anyway, right. but, but it is, <laughs> exactly. there are others out right, there Stuart. who, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It, yeah. I mean, I feel, I feel sorry for Republicans who are kind of principled Republicans or principled conservatives. Say, right. Kind of a George Will or, or, or Charles Krauthammer type, uh, John McCain, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Mitt Romney, uh, Bob Dole, you know, those kind of Republicans slash conservatives you know, they must just be dying inside. Like, oh my God, uh, it's a team sport. I know I'm supposed to support the team, but. Uh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's got to be tough for them, definitely. So, anyway. Yeah. All right, Stuart, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for your work and, and, and your new book is great.